This session is called Health and the Ocean. This session will explore general information about the relationship between the health of the ocean and the human health. It will also discuss the impact of climate change on ocean health and pertinent linkages between the ocean and the current COVID-19 pandemic. The moderator for this session will be Vita Wade of Montserrat, an ocean advocate and founder of Fish and Fins. The speakers include His Excellency Lawrence Gondai, former Prime Minister of Malta. His Excellency Lawrence Gondai led Malta during its first nine years as a member of the European Union, transforming the island nation into a modern dynamic European country. Also, His Excellency Jose Ramos Horta, former Prime Minister of East Timor, National Peace Laureate and internationally known peacemaker. And finally, the youth speaker for this event is Anna Hanhausen, ocean advocate with Plastic Oceans Mexico and Pop Ocean, and recipient of the prestigious Medal of Merit from Mexico Congress. Thank you for joining us. Vita, could you please begin the session? Vita, if you can hear me, we are ready for you to begin moderating. Okay, hello. I was actually just muted. I think I'm on now. If everybody can hear you, hear me. My name is Vita Wade and I'm honored to join you from the tiny Caribbean island of Montserrat. Um, from here, I run a kids ocean club called Fish and Fins and I am absolutely delighted to join in this discussion with so many incredible and distinguished individuals um, who genuinely remind me, um, being from a, a small island with only 4,500 people, the capacity to actually forward change, positive change for our ocean's health when you have very strong, courageous, and, um, and good partnerships throughout the world. Um, that being said, I, I want to welcome uh, our excellencies, Your Excellency uh, Lawrence Gonzi, Your Excellency or His Excellency Jose Ramos Horta, and the wonderful Anna Hans Han Harson. Um, these are, are going to be our guests for this uh, next discussion. We are going to be looking at the, pros the perspectives, the insights and, and actions that are necessary and um, you know, what we're looking at together in regards to the, the link between the ocean and ocean health. So that being said, we have first up His Excellency Lawrence Gonzi. And if you are ready, uh, sir, we, I would like to open the discussion up to you. Thank you very much, uh, Vita. I hope you're uh... Uh, hearing me clearly, all of you, uh, warm greetings from the island of Malta. For those of you um, who have never been to my country, like yours, Vita, ours is a small island in the middle of the Mediterranean, on the south side, close to Italy. We are a member of the European Union, and uh, it was a pleasure for me to see Jose Manuel Barroso, because when I was Prime Minister, he was President of the European Commission, so we were meeting regularly around the table of the European Union. And our greetings to him, as well as greetings to all the friends that I have noticed that are participating, whom I last met last March in, in Durango, in Mexico, when uh, um, Ash Pashauri and, and some of you organized the uh, World Sustainable Development Forum there, and it was an opportunity to discuss a lot of issues related to climate change, but, the, but, but also some focus on the importance of the ocean. You will obviously all understand how important it is, well, how the ocean is important for everybody, but for an island such as mine, where our livelihood, our quality of life, our survival depends on the sea that surrounds us, you will understand how important this is for all of us, from all aspects. I will come back to this point later on. I do not um, intend to give you a lot of details about statistics, etc. I am not a scientist. I am a lawyer by profession. I was in politics for 30 years. And I can give you my perspective as a politician um, with respect to this particular issue. So I, 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 I need to put four points in brief to you. First, we are discussing, of course, the, the importance of the ocean and putting it within the context of our health and the health of the ocean itself. Now, this is curious because the context in which we are all meeting um, today is a context uh, which is very special. Probably the world has never seen anything like this before. We have just, uh, and still are some of us, going through a lockdown situation. 
The whole world came to a stop. The whole world decided, decided to take a decision that had never been taken before. Shut down completely. Why? Because of the pandemic. Because of a virus that has threatened our health. Now, I am impressed because this proves that when we really want to do something about, about an issue, we can really do something extraordinary. But you see, what worries me is with the pandemic, with the COVID-19, there is always the hope that there will be a vaccine in the short term. But hang on, what about our planet? What about the climate change? What about our ocean and the disaster we saw at the beginning of the, the, this, this, this virtual forum with the feature presented to us by Sir David Attenborough? Shouldn't we panic even more about the state we are in today and the state we have brought our oceans on which we depend so much? Um, I keep reminding myself when reading about this matter that, you know, life on our planet started from the ocean. Life started from the sea around us. I am scared that we are, if we don't do something and we don't do it urgently, then life will end because of our ocean, because we have uh, condemned our ocean to become what it is slowly becoming um, a, a major challenge that needs to be addressed. So we need to put our discussion today within this context and understand that we cannot continue to take the oceans for granted. We're surrounded by it, some of us, and we seem to be taking it for granted, thinking that it will remain there forever. Whereas we should be taking urgent action on this first point. Second point, our future depends on what we're going to do about our ocean. I noticed during the chat that went on, um, while there were the other speakers, uh, there, was, there was one particular question which puts a challenge to us. And he said, okay, but, but, but what, are, what, what are we going to do about this? If it is true that our future uh, as human beings depends on the health of our oceans, because we, it, is, it, 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 it impacts complete, our complete lifestyle uh, and our, our uh, survival, then what do we do about this? So, so, so let's understand that our future depends very much, not just on us talking about this issue, but on actual concrete action that need to be taken. It was a pleasure listening to uh, Jose Manuel Barroso. I will um, refer you just please, please, I, 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 um, I invite you to look up the most recent studies uh, and reports carried out by the European Union. The, the latest one I have available is, is, is dated 2019. It is titled Improving International Ocean Governance. It's a, it's a very short report, but clearly lays down some important uh, steps that can be taken on a global, on a regional, on a national level. And I think the young generation, if there is nothing that they can do, they can speak out. They can push their politicians to try and do something about this. Let us not just uh, resign ourselves to the fact that we are communicating via Zoom or via Facebook or via, the pressure needs to be put on the decision takers and the decision makers. Um, they, that was my second point. So that's our future. The third point is a little bit of a positive point. Um, again, linking, linked to what, uh, what I was saying earlier on with respect to the um, uh, pandemic, with respect to the virus. You know, we have learned some lessons in these two months. Uh, I am 66 years of age. But the lessons I've learned in these last two months, I've never learned in 66 years. You know, and one of the lessons is that when we really decide to do something about our environment, our climate, things do change. I'll give you one example. Um, I did not want to take up too much of your time, but um, I, 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 I wanted to put up a, a photo, I have not managed, of our free port. Malta has some beautiful harbors. One of them is a free port. Now you can imagine what happens in a free port. Ships coming in and out, containers in and out. The condition of the harbor where the Freeport is, is something incredible. You know what happened in these last two months? For the first time in, in, in I don't know how many years, we saw dolphins swimming in the harbor where we have our Freeport. Now, now, all the Maltese population were, were flabbergasted. They were surprised. They were happy by the fact that we saw dolphins swimming into our harbor, which, is, which, which so, for so many years was taken over completely 
by the industrial um, uh, operation that is taking there. So, so, so this does change. And nature itself answers, uh, speaks out, in fact, uh, and tells us clearly what needs to be done, what has to be done, and what the results will be. So that, that's, that's, that's a, a message of hope. We have, we have learned, therefore, that small changes in our everyday lifestyle can bring about some dramatic and astonishing changes. This is also the message that they, Sir David Attenborough uh, put to us in his, in his, in his brief um, presentation at the beginning of this, uh, of this uh, forum. Clearly, the ocean is, is, is today um, with less pollution. We see species reappearing in areas that had once been abandoned, and our ecosystems are healthier. So in any way, uh, you, you know what I'm trying to say. If we really put our mind to it, if we, if we really decide that this needs to be done, then for heaven's sake, let's do it because we can actually save this blessed planet. Uh, planet. Finally, my fourth point. Um, when I was in Mexico in, in last March, in, and, and I was scheduled to give my speech in Durango, that same morning, I had my radio on and I was listening to the BBC uh, radio news. And they had just announced on that same day that uh, some researchers had discovered in the deepest part of our ocean, uh, and this is in the, um, uh, the Mariana Trench, which is close to seven kilometers deep, huh? they had discovered um, a species which they had not been aware of before. And they examined this species. And you know what? They found small uh, uh, molecules of plastic present in this species. And they decided, in fact, to call it uh, Eurythinus plasticus. My point here is that even if at that very deep part of our oceans, plastic has managed to reach even at that depth, and, and even species down there are, 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 are presenting these, these, these symptoms, then clearly this is a major issue. And I will conclude on this. We can, take, we can make a list of a thousand different initiatives, but I hang on, I, I, I ride on to the points made earlier. Let us take plastic as a majority, as a priority for us. Let us put plastic as a priority. And you know what? We can put pressure so that we will go back to recycled um, glass bottles instead of plastic bottles. Bottles that can be washed, cleaned, and reused. Let us put plastic to the side. Let us remove it from our daily use. Let us go for alternatives that will help us keep our oceans clean. If we do this, there's much more that can be done. But if we want to take one single project where we can really make a difference, both personally, but also on a national level, then plastic should be our, our, our priority. Thank you very much, all of, our, all of you. It was a pleasure participating. I wish you success and keep strong. Thank you so much, uh, His Excellency uh, Gonzi. You, you said so many different things that really, um, you know, really spoke to me as well uh, about giving our ocean a chance to restore itself. And if you leave the natural environment to itself, then it has that huge potential. But, you know, in the meantime, what do we do? We need to be working on action. And I think one of the messages that came through to me was the need for urgent action, just as we have dealt with the coronavirus, and not a spirit of complacency, but a spirit of urgency. And um, I hear that message loud and clear. Um, and, you know, it was, it was really good as well to hear your, um, your emphasis on our next generation and the part um, we and they can play in in actually advocating, um, which is really the purpose of, of what our pop family are, are intending to do. So His Excellency, thank you so much. And um, I, I could even maybe share a little bit with some of those who are um, listening in that, you know, I'm not a politician at all, but last year I ran in our election and that was because I really wanted to raise the voice and conversations around ocean um, health and wellness. Um, and I, I, I too share in that, um, His Excellency, in that there is those young people who are listening that want to advocate and raise their voices. And I, I think on one perspective, yes, we can push, put pressure on the decision makers. And on the other perspective, we can also become the decision makers. So 
you know, really grateful for that insight, um, especially from another person in a small island uh, developing state where plastics, uh, you know, are ravaging our shores in places too. Um, and not often the, even the plastics that we have um, used ourselves. But um, so a great thank you to you. I thoroughly enjoyed that session and I'm sure many others have as well. Um, next, I would like to invite His Excellency Jose Ramos Horta, um, president or former president of, East, of uh, Timor-Leste and Nobel, Nobel Peace, Peace Prize winner in 1996. So um, His Excellency, if you're with us and you're um, I, I believe, actually, if I remember correctly, we we anticipated some issues with regards to connectivity, and we have got a pre-recorded um, statement uh, presentation from His Excellency uh, Romas Hota. Uh, can we go ahead and run that? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. While we're waiting for that um, video to to launch. I'm not sure if we're experiencing some connectivity issues, but um, Dr. Dr. Jose Ramos Horta will be with us, and I think he still is with us. So if you have questions at the end of his presentation, uh, please pop them into the chat. I think that video is rolling Hello, now. All of you who are tuning in to this uh, exceptionally important uh, event on oceans. Uh, warmest greetings to all of you. I hope wherever you are, uh, stay safe with your uh, closest uh, family, relatives, uh, friends in your uh, communities. Uh, I have to start with the good news from my country, Timor-Leste. We, right now, we have a zero uh, reported infection for the last uh, month now. We do not have a, a single reported confirmed coronavirus, uh, COVID-19 infection. We had uh, 28, of which 24 were imported from Indonesia, Timorese uh, students who were living in Indonesia and in return were diagnosed with uh, COVID-19. Uh, several uh, foreigners, nationalities, all have recovered, confirmed they have done a necessary double test to confirm that they are negative. We do not have uh, any community transmission. But we are continuing with a reasonable, not excessive uh, prevention uh, measures. So far, uh, so good. Zero case uh, in uh, Timor-Leste. Of course, the international media does not report it because the international media, as usual, point to countries like New Zealand and others, Western countries. Uh, only Western countries uh, supposedly know how to uh, do good, and we all miserable, isolated, small island states, we don't know how to look after ourselves. But I have to say, the good news is that uh, we right now have a zero uh, COVID-19 case. The other good news from this part of the world, Timor-Leste, is that we are part of the so-called Coral Triangle. The Coral Triangle comprises Timor-Leste, Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands, Malaysia and the Philippines. More than 100 million people depend on the health of the coral system in the coral triangle region for their livelihood. And the good news is Timor-Leste has the healthiest undamaged, unbleached coral system. In addition to this great news, scientists from Australia and elsewhere have identified 
think this video has just paused a little bit, so let's give it a couple minutes and see if it starts to flow again. Situated right in the middle between the Pacific Ocean and the Indian Ocean. The Pacific Ocean flow into the Indian Ocean and the currents of cold water bathe the whole island of Timor-Leste from different sides. So in spite of global warming, uh, we do not have any, have detected any damage uh, as a result of global warming on our corals. Uh, photographers, scientists, filmmakers who have been here in recent months, they have reported that they have never seen anything like that in the world. Riches, biodiversity, and damaged, unbleached coral life. We are a population of a bit over 1.3 million. Timor-Leste is part of the so-called least developed countries. We are part of the so-called fragile states. Timor-Leste actually with Sierra Leone, with Liberia, we are the leaders of the G7 plus small fragile countries. And we are doubly impacted by climate change. We are impacted by the global warming, rising sea levels, but also the unpredictable, unstable weather patterns. It can rain in our country, start supposedly October, November, but it can start only in January of this year, and it goes on till May. We still have had very strong rains, which make life difficult for farmers and for fishermen. The connection between the health of the oceans and the health of human beings is so obvious. When we look, for instance, at the radiation levels as a result of the tsunami in Japan that damaged the Fukushima nuclear power, it affected, uh, increased the level of radiation in the seas near Japan and uh, beyond. Any dumping of uh, waste, hospital waste dumped by Western countries, particularly from Europe, that collect hospital waste and dump in the Indian Ocean. Cruise ships that dump waste into the vast oceans. Plastics that are done by many people, including our own, including the hundreds of millions of people in Asia region that purchase plastic, not only plastic bags, but everything that contains plastic and don't know how to discard, how to recycle, dump in rivers, and the, the floods come and wash the plastic into the ocean. One immediate consequence, it poison the corals, poison the fish, diminish the livelihood, but also it can poison ourselves, those who consume uh, fish, uh, sea uh, resources. Who are responsible? One thing that is extraordinary, as I uh, sometimes look, the things that we, many of us use the other end. Toothpaste, a toothbrush, a carton of uh, milk, or yogurt, or anything. We import it from wherever they are manufactured elsewhere in Asia or in Australia. We import, we pay for it. We even pay for these things. We pay not for the content, but we pay for the container that uh, cover uh, these products. When we finish the product, we use up the toothpaste, the cream. What we do with it? Well, we dump in our own country. So I understand countries like the Philippines, Malaysia, they decide to send back to uh, Canada, to send back to Australia, all the waste that we get 
can you imagine? I cannot understand it. We pay for these damn things. We pay the product, we pay import duties. And then we are the ones who have to live with this product that we pay to you. So I would like to say, please come and collect all your garbage here. If I ever go back to the presidency or to my gov to our government, yeah, one legislation I would force to introduce is all the garbage that we collect, either someone, a rich Western country foundation, set up here a uh, recycling uh, system so that we can recycle and transform it into whatever, into uh, energy or into uh, fertilizers, I don't know. Or, I'm sorry, but we will put on a boat and send back to you. Before I end my uh, contribution today, I would like first um, to pay tribute to the Pashauri family. To you, Dr. Ash, and your entire family for continuing uh, the legacy of your father who started this um, uh, wall uh, <coughs> sustainable uh, development uh, forum that bring us uh, to discuss, to share ideas about to, uh, the state of our world. Second, the COVID pandemic that uh, shattered lives around the world Tens of millions of people uh, have been impoverished, hundreds of millions have been impoverished, many hundreds of thousands uh, uh, killed and died as a result of it. The global uh, recession that impacted the lives of all of us, many of us, most of us who uh, are at the receiving end of this pandemic, these and other pandemics over which we poor countries have a little control and a little say. I wish to end by appealing to the rich and the powerful of the world. At least for once, at least for once, do not be so insensitive, so greedy. Pharmaceutical companies, governments, make sure that any vaccine or cure to prevent coronavirus COVID-19 or to treat it is made available for free first for the least developed countries LDCs for the fragile states and for developing countries and maybe in the West because you are more affluent, maybe your government can subsidize so that the companies that have invested, produced, may uh, recover some of the investments. But for once in our lifetime, in your lifetime, show wisdom and the solidarity. Do not argue over who should have uh, the intellectual property over it and how much to profit from it, but rather how many lives you can save. I thank you and God bless you all. God bless us all. Thank you very much. Um, I hope you're all still hearing me. Um, thank you very much, His Excellency Jose Ramos Hota. That was um, such a, a, a really refreshing presentation. You're um, very straightforward, very candid. And um, I think all of us enjoyed and appreciated that. Um, and I think that's exactly the type of honest um, you know, dialogue that we need to have as we, we aim towards finding very real solutions and actions. Um, you, you, you really ended on that point of the moral leadership and how important moral leadership is for our uh, small island developing states, um, our fragile economies, um, our citizens and our, our children and grandchildren's futures. Um, so 
thank you so much. Um, it's my understanding that it's about uh, 1 a.m. in Timor Leste. So we unfortunately won't have His Excellency for question and answer, but you're still invited to pop your questions in and um, I'm sure our technical teams will do their very best to have them answered and sent to you. Um, so that being said, our final uh, speaker is the very bright and very talented um, Anna Hanhausen from Pop Ocean, Plastic Oceans, Mexico. And we're very privileged to have her um, being a part of our discussion on the link between the ocean and our health. So with that being said, I would like to invite um, Miss Anna Hanhausen to present. Anna? Hello, everyone. <laughs> yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, Over to perfect. you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Veda, for the introduction. So, as I was researching about this topic, about the relationship between the health of the o and the ocean, I realized that they're more closely related than I had realized. Not only do we have ocean species that have helped in medical discoveries, but the effects of, hu of human action on the ocean affect the ocean's health, and this in turn affects our health. A clear example of this is pollution. Chemical pollution, for example, such as oil spills, kills thousands of species. It's estimated that the 2010 BP oil spill pushed overfished species closer to the brink of extinction. And also people in close contact with these oil spills have shown physical and mental negative effects. Also, the effect of chemical pollution on fish and shellfish result in food shortages that can put in danger many small communities. Another example, and a very common and big example, is plastic pollution. A recent study found that we had underestimated the amount of microplastics that we have in our ocean. In 2019, a study found that there's up to 8.3 million pieces of microplastics per square meter of the ocean. The issue is so serious that even plankton have been found to have microplastics in their systems. As we eat seafood, toxic chemicals from microplastics ingested by the fish go into our system, and this can cause autoimmune system suppression, birth defects, and endocrine disruption. Also, estimates calculate that we eat up to a credit card worth of plastic each week. So I think that really puts into perspective how much um, of the plastic we put into the oceans is affecting us as well. The current pandemic is, expect, is expected to worsen the pollution issue as only 1% of the face masks used are disposed of correctly. Already, thousands of gloves, gowns, and face masks have been washing up on the shores, highlighting the deficient waste management plans that exist today. However, COVID-19 does not only pose a threat to our oceans, it's also an opportunity. COVID-19 has shown us that if an issue is taken seriously enough, changes can and will happen. Extraordinary measures have been taken as the World Health Organization named the virus a pandemic, and countries around the world established it as an emergency, indirectly causing a drastic decrease in greenhouse gas emissions. If the climate emergency is treated as, as such, we can reduce carbon emissions to a point where positive effects start becoming evident in our marine ecosystems. It's also important to mention that not doing anything to mi mitigate climate change will result in a bigger economic crisis than the one we're already approaching because of the virus. As I mentioned earlier, bacteria have been widely studied for medical use. However, only 90, 80 to 95% of our oceans remain unexplored. This opens up many possibilities to new scientific findings that link our dependence on the healthy oceans even further. Finally, as part of the youth speakers, I'd like to point out how the youth across the world have become drivers of change. We recognize the importance of caring for our planet and the right the next generations have to a healthy and resilient ecosystem. This is why it's a responsibility to make the right decisions and change our consumption patterns to buy products that aren't harmful to the environment. On the other side, we need to stay informed on, on what is happening right now. So we know what scientists state as the course of action to be taken, and we can join environmental efforts to achieve the necessary goals. Thank you very much. I, I hope all this information was a helpful insight on what is going on and the relationship between human health and the health of the ocean. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. That was, that was truly fantastic. And your presentation, I'm sure, has, um, you know, has, has touched me in terms of um, your, your 
knowledge and dedication and it's certainly definitely a sign of great hope for our Excellent. future Excellent. um you know and so that brings us to the the end of our um our session on the uh, our health and our ocean um i i hope you're still hearing me i'm hearing a little bit of interest in the background but um i just wanted to say again a huge thank you to all of our um, distinguished guests again um his excellency lawrence gonzi former prime minister of malta um we will remember the need for urgent action and not complacency um and his excellency jose ramos ahota former president of east timor and nobel Peace prize winner i'm sure many of us would love to visit your country to enjoy some of that marine biodiversity and and do remember that if you if you ever get to sort out the um the waste um, and shipping them back, please visit the Caribbean islands as well. And you can tell them to stop off at Montserrat. We very much will appreciate that. Um, so again, from the Pop, Pop Ocean family, a huge thank you um, for all of our participants in this session. And I'm, I'm passing it over to now to our next moderator, uh, Dr. Sivra, and she'll be discussing the ocean and the economy. So from me, thank you so much.